and we are back. Warp and Move Radio, Radio Next TV and Twitter group site. We come to you every Wednesday from 11 to 11.50. Glad to join you here again this week. We took last week off, Memorial Day week. Grateful again for all of those who have given the ultimate sacrifice uh, to give us our freedoms in these days in the United States of America in 2019. Uh, grateful for all of that. My wife and I, Robin and I, took off for an educator retreat last week. Actually, uh, in anticipation of celebrating 40 years together, this coming August is our anniversary, and uh, we've spent 40 years, husband and wife, grateful for those years. But of course, after a long year of teaching, uh, we just needed a break. So glad to take last week off, looking forward to the weeks ahead. Uh, the folks will be joining us. Just a shout out to our sponsor, the Cominius Institute. At the Cominius Institute, we cross three bridges. First bridge is into college. We help college young people, specifically Christian college young people, to think Christianly about their subject areas. But I meet with all kinds of students, all kinds of faculty on the campus of IUPUI. And a shout out to all those of you who are manning the, the Caribou Coffee booth. Thank you ever so much for keeping us caffeinated. The second bridge we cross is into community. We do that every Wednesday on the radio show. Grateful for introducing Indianapolis and communities around Indianapolis to Christians who are doing good based on Titus 3, 1, 8, and 14. Do good, do good, do good. And finally, we approach culture. It's our third bridge that we cross. I'm constantly writing, speaking uh, about all different manner of things. Uh, anything, any chance I get to uh, publicize the kinds of things that uh, we are doing at Cominius, thinking Christianly about things. Actually, uh, one of the big things that you might engage if you're at all interested is going to our website, cominiusinstitute.org or uh, .com, or my website, warpandwoof.org, that's W-A-R-P-A-N-D-W-O-O-F.org, and you can find there our latest offerings, which are uh, called Truth in Two. So every Tuesday, I put out a two-minute video, which explains Christian truth in two minutes, and this week's is on cinema, on film, on watching movies and how propaganda actually begins through film. You might learn something about Vladimir Lenin, communism, and how the Marxists actually wanted to control movies. So uh, we are back this week, grateful to have the opportunity to uh, share the microphone today with somebody uh, quite special, Elizabeth Williams. Thanks ever so much for joining us here. Thanks, Mark. We are glad uh, for all different kinds of things that you're invested in around the community. Why don't you kind of give us a big picture overview of all the stuff that you do in and around Indianapolis? Sure, absolutely. So I met Mark at IUPUI. I just graduated with my degree in philanthropy. So for the past two years, that's been a big part of my life is learning and studying there. I also am a real estate agent for Flat Collective and do some transaction management for them. And then in the past have worked with a few different CDCs, learning about more about the neighborhoods and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. I also love photography, so do that on the side as well. And I think that's it. Well, uh, did I see something recently or maybe last year about the Sagamore Institute? Yeah, that was an internship I had last winter. Through, oh, no, last summer. It was last summer, yeah. Last yeah. Summer? Uh, Sagmore in Institute, which partnered me with Jeff Sparks and SEND, so doing some CDC work in Twin Air, a neighborhood on the southeast side of the neighborhood. So tell everybody, just so everybody knows what the initials stand for, what does CDC stand for? CDC stands for Community Development Corporation, so they're usually corporations in neighborhoods that work to connect neighbors with resources they need in the community. Yes. So your particular focal point on CDCs then was in what neighborhood? Tell everybody just kind of generally about the neighborhood and the context of that neighborhood. Yes. So I grew up on the east side of Indianapolis, but the internship that I did placed me in Twin Air, which is a neighborhood East Fountain Square area. So kind of east of State Street is usually the line we draw. Okay. Yeah. And your focus while you were there, uh, what was the focus that you were intending? Tended to do. Mm -hmm. I was really interested in learning more about affordable housing, what that looked like, both kind of the inventory that was there and ah. some of the work being done to mm -hmm. figure out kind of solutions going forward as areas are redeveloping. One of the things I remember about conversations you and I have had in the past uh, had to do with gentrification. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually did a show on this a couple of years ago, 
and I remember sending you the link to it, and you got all excited about uh, that particular discussion point and wondering how that might fit into your philanthropy studies. So tell us, see, whether you go to gentrification or not, it really doesn't matter all that much, but tell us about your philanthropy studies and what specifically you were targeting in those in that particular time period in your studies. Yeah, absolutely. So throughout the school of philanthropy, I think my target was this idea of community, and it did start out in affordable housing, um, both because of my interest. I think I was really thankful to be able to experience both sides of this. So as a realtor, seeing the really exciting ways cities develop and how, um, yeah, it's just fun and exciting to be involved in that side of things. And then also having these internships that kind of helped me wrestle with just like, well, what does this actually mean? Um, and then some just learning that it's a really nuanced conversation and it requires a lot of, even on my part, it's a lot, a lot more studying and experience needs to go into it. So that was kind of what I got excited about at the beginning of my journey, my long journey of two years in the school <laughs> of philanthropy. Um, and then kind of over over those two years, it, it evolved into just this idea of what is community and why is it so important and associationalism in general and people being together and how that um, how that's what we're built for. And that's really exciting. And I feel like that tied into everything I was doing really well. Mm. I, I love hearing about these kinds of things. One of the things that uh, kind of sparked my interest in what you just said were, were two words, uh, nuance and justice. So every fall, my pastors asked me to teach at our church, uh, teaching the adult class. This summer or this fall, I'll be teaching on the minor prophets. As you well know, the minor prophets had a lot to say about justice issues mm -hmm. and specifically about those who have and have not, the rich and the poor and so on. Um, Tell us a little bit about anything that you know comes to your mind uh, about those kinds of issues, uh, things that you saw, things that were uh, disappointing, discouraging, but also maybe those things which might have been encouraging, mm -hmm. where you saw some some benefits or moving in the right direction. Sure, sure. Well, I think it's nuanced, is my no. There, no, that's good. That's <laughs> the good. Same answer. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I think in my. Experience, Experience, just witnessing things, I was actually really encouraged. Um, I was encouraged with the relationships that I saw were, were being formed and just the ways people were. I mean, I think the fact that it is such a conversation right now is really encouraging because it means people are thinking critically, um, even if they're thinking differently about it. Um, and then I think in my kind of just studying and understanding and, and reading of the scriptures, it it does seem that <clears throat> justice is a it's a holistic topic, and justice looks like the restoration of relationships in in lots of directions, relationships with your neighbors and with the Lord and with yourself. And so, trying to figure out, man, those are all ways I can step into in different ways, and even if it doesn't look like justice in how maybe the culture would think of what justice has to look like, even just entering into relationships and being really intentional with knowing your neighbors and knowing people different than you is a really beautiful way to get that started. It is an important issue. And another word that kind of popped out here, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's really important is the word holistic. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the justice issue being holistic, you can't just look at it from one perspective. Let's just say, for, the, for, for instance, from the framework of just monetary issues. Sure, absolutely. It's got to be much more than that. Uh, when you think about justice and being holistic in your views of justice and all the rest of that, uh, what is it? What you, you mentioned relationships would be one thing. Can you think of other things that would be in, involved in the process of thinking from a justice-centered Christian point of view? Uh, you can go at this from real estate issues or who lives where or whatever the case. Yeah, I can. <laughs> uh, yeah, so obviously I feel like it does It does start on relationships. I think just education is a really big part of what does 
justice look like and making sure that <coughs> their knowledge and their and their resources and access to that education around so if we're talking about money I guess or monetary things and me learning like how owning land and having capital is really important in somebody's financial future so as a realtor and somebody who's involved getting involved in CDCs what does it mean for neighbors to know how that can happen or have those access accesses to that information to go ask questions and figure out oh, well, if I can't own a home now, but that's the desire, like how do I get there? What are the steps to doing that? One of the things, one of the guests actually a couple weeks ago that we had on air was somebody who helps folks uh, with purchasing of homes. So, you know, you are in the process of doing that with, as a real estate agent. Right. Which I by the way, <laughs> yeah, you hope. <laughs> that's you, the goal. <laughs> and just for the sake of saying this, everybody, for those of you who, at all interested in some of the most interesting, inventive, creative, and hilarious comments about real estate. Follow this young woman because uh, the stuff that she puts out there is just hilarious. This one with the dog of late was really just oh, really funny. I didn't get them to sign on the bottom line, but I got to be with their dog. Right, right, it was the right. essence of that. Yeah. So the real estate issue for you, uh, why did you see this as some a direction that you personally should go into. Absolutely. I didn't. I, <laughs> you didn't. I didn't. No, it was, I'm so thankful. And it's, it was something I, I kind of fell into. I started out in this office space as an admin assistant, my first year of mm. college, watering plants, making coffee, really good at <laughs> that. Plants. On my res Actually, I wasn't good at watering the plants. <laughs> I overwatered them. <laughs> They all died. They oh, were from Ikea, funny. and they only need to be watered once every two weeks, I learned. So <laughs> I drowned them. We're much better now. Okay. So you can learn in everything, I guess. I told you. She's yeah. hilarious. Um, so I was in this office space doing admin work, got connected with one of the one of the Platt Collective's teams that mm -hmm. works out of this office, and started doing admin work for them. And then as I was just exposed to it, I was excited with, how fast and flexible the job was and kind of the entrepreneurial nature of what it means to be a real estate agent. And I like challenges and it seemed like a great challenge. I was going to try and get my realtor's license before my 19th birthday, but I failed first time. So I had to get it the day after my 19th birthday. So not that cool. But oh, wow. Just, that's <laughs> such a setback. <laughs> I know it was really tragic, but I, Keeps me humble. So, anyways, <laughs> I got involved in real estate that way. And then, as I've been in it, I think I kind of have formed. I mean, I think a lot of people ask, like, what's what's the relationship between philanthropy and real estate and photography? And it started out where I just wanted to have an answer. But then, actually, as I began to think critically about it, um, and from a biblical point of view, they really are all connected which I, I love that that's how it works, that even jobs like real estate can be connected to what the Lord's put on my heart. And so kind of from there, figured out this like desire to create places for people to be in relationship and be rooted and be known. Yeah. Uh, the issue of place is huge. Uh, I, I believe in theology of place. I believe that people are rooted and grounded in certain places mm -hmm. and then of course they bear responsibility for that place yeah and uh to then restore and reinvigorate a place yeah. is a big deal so whether or not you do this to a home or to a neighborhood whatever in fact i even say to people you know anytime you wash dishes or dust the shelves or vacuum a carpet you literally are practicing regenerative processes. Absolutely. So the restoration of things can be as simple as that yeah. or as broad as refurbishing a house HGTV style. Kind right. Of thing, right. You know? <laughs> uh, by the way, is that in your future HGTV? I don't think so. Okay. Just I've tried some YouTube home videos and they haven't gone well. So I think well. <laughs> you for, can find them on YouTube. <laughs> for those of you who are interested in a career in real estate, remember you begin by killing the plants. That's the key to all of this, is right. killing the plants. That's your stepping stone. Right, right. So, that's how it all I'm going to be chuckling about that all day, I have to say that. So, 
coming back to the issue of real estate, you mentioned uh, just a moment ago how people were asking you, so what's the relationship between these three things? And obviously it has an awful lot to do with relationship. Right. And you're approaching this from a, a basically a biblical vantage point as a Christian. Uh, when you think about doing good things, tell us a story or two about some good things that have been manifest from photography, from real estate, from philanthropy, whatever. Sure. I think it's all been good. Can I say that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> absolutely you can. Um, yeah, I think, so a good thing that's come from photography is just being able to capture moments and people in relationship in a really genuine way. Mm -hmm. I think, I think I've had to think really critically about what does it mean to be a photographer in this world dominated by social media and dominated by people caring more about the picture than the moment. Mm -hmm. And so trying to be able to be a photographer who, who really does just want to capture what photography used to be, mm -hmm. um, which is just like the real moment that you can look back on in a lot of years and say like, hey, that's the story that, you know, you're in that I was in. Yep. Um, so that's been really good just to be able to share that part of my heart with the people I take pictures of and for them to be able to say, oh, I haven't thought about it like that before, but I think that is the kind of photography that I really would like. Um, that's been really good. And it's been really good just to capture really beautiful things. I've had the opportunity to travel a lot in the last two years. A lot might be generous, but a few times in the last two years. And every time I see something incredible and I go to take a picture of it and I develop the picture and look at it later, just realizing that this picture is just an echo of how beautiful it was mm. actually to look at it. Mm. And that's been something that's really drawn me to just worship the creator in a way that that I did it before, recognizing that actually just looking at the nature is amazing and so much better than anything I could create or capture. Mm -hmm. So kind of draw, drawing me to wonder a little bit more mm -hmm. at the at the creation. Yeah. You mentioned uh, a moment ago about developing pictures. So I'm assuming, like most of us walk around with these things, and we're taking shots of our grandkids, sure. you know, They're whatever. Great. So... You're developing pictures, so do you have a dark room you do this in? Oh, no, I don't. I wish I did. That, I just meant taking the pictures, pulling them up on, you know, my Adobe software and, and adjusting the lighting in ways that I think enhance it and make it. Um, I think that's a, a big part of the artistic process for me. Yeah. Is, uh, so that's the afterword, as it were. Yeah. The yeah. after that's, echo, yeah. as you suggested. Sure. The yeah. after echo. Well, this kind of uh, idea about travel, let's pick up on that for a moment because you have done a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just assure you, you okay, have done a lot. You. Uh, you've gone in lots of different directions, lots of different places with lots of different mm -hmm. people. What attracts you to the process of travel? Why is that important to you? Great question. It's important for me to see different places and meet different people. And I think I've traveled a lot by myself and that's been a really reflective process for me and I always joke that like I love Indianapolis that's another thing about me I think if you follow me long enough you'll pick up on but I also love traveling for like two weeks and then coming back so it kind of gives me even though I've committed to Indianapolis to making it home it gives me another another little window to go and see the world and it also reminds me how good home is mm -hmm. I I I think when I had this moment, I was traveling to see a friend in St. Andrews, Scotland, and I was on a bus by myself through the Scottish countryside, which was really beautiful. But I think I felt the loneliness of like, this is not my home and these are not the people that I know. And so coming back and being really thankful for, mm -hmm. for the place that, sure. that I'm in. Let's make sure, by the way, to give a shout out to your mom and dad. Yeah, big shout out. Yeah. Dad. Because, you know, ever since I've known you, uh, that the emphasis that you placed on parents and home mm -hmm. has been huge. And I've always been really grateful for that because it really, you set a precedent for others, I think, in your, your thoughtfulness about your mom and dad. Wow. Well, I hope so. They really are very cool. They're watching us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are very cool. Did you all hear that? Very cool. Parents can be very cool. We're going to be taking a one-song break, and when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation 
with Elizabeth Williams. Thankful ever so much for her varied life. And perhaps we might even talk about her jumping out of airplanes in the second segment. Looking forward to that. Facebook Live, you stay with us. We'll be right back after a one song break on the radio. Are you singing? Yeah. <laughs> doing so, doing good. Uh, jumping out of airplanes, is that a fair game? Sure. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and I did want to, I didn't think about this fast enough before I kind of cut to break, but um, you need to give a shout out to Platt. To the folks there, and you know, beyond what maybe you've said, and maybe the philanthropy school too, and maybe what we've learned. Um, other things that you would like to discuss? Anything that comes to your mind? I don't want to run roughshod over. Mm -hmm. you know, what well, you might you're be great. Oh, thanks. I'm not very good at improv, so. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. so I just keep throwing questions at you, and you're good. <laughs> oh, so I'm not very good, but I can get better <laughs> as this goes on. Maybe. I'll well, what I mean by that is you've been doing just fine oh, okay. so far, so yeah. you just want me to keep asking sure. questions. Yeah, I like how it's easy. It's going to be precision on 20 year old, this 50 year old mind and blow it away. <laughs> you are incredible. Oh, thank you. He's sitting over there with a big Cheshire cat smile on his face for that reason. Yeah. So I'm trying to teach this young to layers of thought, mm -hmm. enveloping everything. You know? I like, you know, your words obviously are important you picked up on those nuanced and holistic um, not something honestly Christians think an awful lot about frankly mm. and if I could be so bold need to think more about sure. honestly you know this is something I talk about all the time in classes that to me the question isn't really what or why for us it the question is more how and when so what's the method and means by which you're going to be communicating or saying or doing that? right and then when do you Sure. Because yeah. there could be bad times to say whatever you want to say. Absolutely. And maybe you should wait sometimes yes. a year. <laughs> Things you learn the hard way. <laughs> yeah, sometimes that's true too. Yeah. We should. Sure. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> just so you know, you're not alone in any of this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So feel free to just kind of lean in there and say, yeah, I'm, I'm with Mark on this one. I just really think that, uh, you know, I blow it, and uh, he does too. And, yeah. I'll be able to take that heat. <laughs> yeah, so this this young one over here has uh, jumped out of airplanes, HP. What do you think? I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm scared to death. <laughs> Jumping out of any. I couldn't jump off this table. <laughs> yeah. HP and I have been doing this for over three and a half years, so we've had a long history here. Wow. <laughs> Holy cow. Just, uh, so, yeah, I just celebrated eight years uh, two weeks ago. Oh, oh, my show. Nice. I do a show. Oh, um, now your birthday? <laughs> 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 Go ahead with your little jazz. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been a good ride. Yeah. Good How does ride it feel to uh, jump off an airplane? It feels pretty crazy. There's like three different feelings I felt jumping out of an airplane. What was those three feelings? Well, the first one was pretty scared going up on the little tiny plane you're riding around. So I'm pretty scared, right? That is pretty scary. Yeah. And then I jump off, and there's 30 seconds of total free fall, which is the best feeling I've ever felt. So fun. So much joy. Then the parachute goes off, and when you're falling, 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 and the parachute goes off, you kind of shoot back up in the air, and I get really motion sick. So the third feeling is probably <laughs> nausea. <laughs> So, and go. relief that the parachute went off. <laughs> that was a great question. Yeah. I think I'm going to, you know, kind of tag on to your question and, and ask her that question. Here oh, I've already practiced my answer. See, you're, you're already good. Keep you know? it up. Yeah. So, Sorry thanks. Thanks for hanging in there with us, Facebook Live. Grateful for you to be in here with us today. Uh, these are the kinds of uh, discussions that we have off air, so the podcast people don't ever get to hear this kind of stuff, which is kind of cool. Uh, yeah, really, man. really glad to uh, do this. Well, you said it, improv, uh, just kind of picking up little things here and there. And, and yes, most conversations are improv, so <laughs> they are. You, you should have seen Mark and I when we first started. He came in the scripted bandit boy. He had everything scripted, and I used to mess. Q and Q cards, you're holding. And I am Mr. <laughs> I am Mr. Oh, because I mean never scripted. 
you know, yeah, so we, it was so funny. I it was. <laughs> He's finally gotten me to loosen up. It took me a long time. I mean, literally, I had scripts and what I was going to say. Wow. I mean, the whole, I'm an academic, you know, we do stuff like this. Right, right, right. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so we don't do that anymore. Gotcha. We just have this little conversation mm-hmm. after this is over. A little Facebook here. Christian young people may leave. Facebook can't do anything about it. attending public <laughs> universities. One of the key ingredients to maintaining Christian faith commitment through college is personal spiritual investment in students. We are committed to spending time with Christian young people. The Comedians Institute, where Christian wisdom and college life. And we are back. And whatever he said on that, uh, yeah, the promo there, our nice little intersection commercial with Comedians. Uh, That's just something that we do every single week during the semester, uh, fall and spring semesters at IUPUI, meeting with Christian young people, talking with them about uh, the ideas that are important to them, their disciplines, the classes, things they're hearing around campus. And of course, that's how Elizabeth and I met. Elizabeth Williams joins us here in our second uh, segment of this hour to talk about life and things from her perspective, again, from a focal point of a Christian doing good in the community. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of fun to go back to that thing about uh, jumping out of airplanes. So since we've already practiced the answer off air with Facebook Live people, let's just go to that. Uh, The question is, uh, how did you feel when you jumped out of an airplane? Yeah, I, and as I answered before, I think when I think about, I've jumped out of an airplane twice now. And both times I've had the same three feelings. We're going up on, I don't know, you've never jumped out of an airplane. I do recommend it. But the first step is to get in this this really small, rickety airplane. The, the skydiving place I went to, the airplane said verygoodplane.com on the side. So <laughs> advertising, that made me feel secure. And <laughs> uh, so you're up there. You're strapped to your tandem jumper. There's six people in this tiny plane, no room to move at all. So that's probably the scariest part is you're going out processing what you're doing. And then jumping off the airplane, there was about a 30 second free fall, which is probably one of my favorite feelings and sensations to date is just that falling straight through the sky. You don't really know which direction is up or down. Um, It's pretty amazing. And then the parachute goes off and shoots you straight back up in the air. And at that point I get really motion sickness. So I my feeling is nausea. That's the third feeling. And then relief that the parachute. Yeah, the relief. Yeah, that, that would be a big deal to me. That this would be the relief. Absolutely. <laughs> so I have to ask the obvious question here. Why in the world <laughs> would you want to jump out of an airplane? Well, it was on my, I had a list of 20 things I wanted to do before I turned 20. Like a bucket list, but the bucket list felt like too long of a goal. So I moved the the deadline up closer. So it was 20 things I wanted to do before I turned 20. And one of them was go skydiving. And I went and I thought that it was so much fun that I went twice, but I probably will not go again. (laughs) And you killed me. I got to tell you, most people, when they think about a bucket list, they talk about this as something they want to do before they die. This one wants to do something before she's 20. (laughs) Just amazing. And of course that you failed a real estate test just before you were 19, but then passed it right over and felt like this was a big moment of disappointment. No, no, no. I recovered. It was, it was great. Not disappointing. (laughs) Well, we're really glad. (laughs) (laughs) The standards that you set for yourself are really (laughs) quite impressive. So let's give a couple of shouts out. Let's uh, do a shout out to Platt and then also to IUPUI Philanthropy. Absolutely. Yes. Both Platt Collective which is the brokerage I work for, and the Lilly Family School Philanthropy have been really instrumental in these last two years, and so I'm really thankful. Yeah, good stuff. And you said, uh, or I noticed this on Facebook, actually, before I actually talked with you this morning, uh, you're going to go back to mm-hmm. I'll be continuing my degree in philanthropy through the Lilly School. Okay, and what degree will you accomplish? Philanthropic studies. Philanthropic studies, yes. a master's, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. Master's, master's in philanthropic studies. Okay. So, what do you intend to do with that? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my desire to get my master's degree was really to continue to develop the skills that had been started in undergrad and 
and get more experience in the sector of philanthropy to see where I'm interested in working, maybe for a ministry or a nonprofit. Um, but I have a year and a half to figure that out. Yeah, so. <laughs> you, got a, you got a minute to do that. Uh, just saying this, and you know, I think it's fair enough to say this on air, uh, even though I haven't said this to you before, uh, I'm just going to go on record right now and say that, yes, you should go on to do your PhD at some point in the future. Oh. Just so you know, that's what Echo believes. Are you funding that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just got nailed to the wall there, Facebook Live. <laughs> yeah, I would love to fund All that, right. actually. I would love to fund that. Um, one of the things that... No, 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 that's okay. Because one of the things, you kind of segue without even knowing you segue. Uh, one of the things that, that you and I uh, talked about in one of our earliest conversations, I remember, uh, was I was asking you about what you wanted to do with your degree. And this was undergrad, and this was a couple of years ago. And you said, uh, I really am interested in working in nonprofits. Is that still the case? Yeah. And... I've grown to learn that that is probably the only thing my degree does. So <laughs> that, yeah, I I think I answered. I'm interested in working with nonprofits. I started off with a business degree and then transferred into maybe I was thinking nonprofit management. Um, but then I've grown to see the kind of the fundraising grant writing side of what philanthropy does and how important that is to the life of a nonprofit and how actually they talk about as a philanthropist for an organization, you're a steward of the story of, and the mission, so you're responsible in ways people usually don't see for advancing mm -hmm. the mission, for telling the story honestly to secure funding. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Well, see, to me, this, this goes all the way back to that conversation because one of the things I said to you at that point, I still remember that I said this to you, uh, I said, when you get your degree, come and help me with my nonprofit. Right, so, I Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, that whole thing about passing passing the torch, passing the baton on to the next generation, looking for somebody who might be the next president of Cominius. Just keep some of that stuff in mind. You know, on just the in, the, in the back burner of your thinking, you gotcha. know, when you think about these things and things you might Will like do. to do in the future. Uh, all kinds of uh, <laughs> interesting directions you can go with that. And you said that you are going to make into your home. That's just the plan for the future. I'm going to make Indianapolis your home. Oh, yeah, that's the plan for that. And tell us about uh, the church that you're attending right now. Mm -hmm. So I currently attend Redeemer Presbyterian, which is a church on 16th and Delaware. Big shout out to them; they're awesome. Um, and I actually just became a member a few weeks ago. Good. So good, absolutely. Uh, actually, we were just uh, Charlie Mitchell and I, a church planner friend of mine, came out to spend a few days with me uh, in Indianapolis, and he said. There are two things I want to do when I'm in Indy. The first is I want to have a really good tenderloin. Oh. Yeah, I know. Are you known for those? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. I don't know. I had to look it up. Yeah. But anyway, the tenderloin, we went, it's called Wiener Schnitzel in German, German just so you're aware. Uh, so we went down to this great place in the city and got this big thing that overlapped the plate. It was amazing. But the second thing he said was, I want, I want you, Doc, to take me to a place that shows art in the city. Oh. So I immediately contacted Joanna Taft, Absolutely. and we set up a little bit of a tour, and Charlie got to see what goes on. His thing, just for the future reference of this, too, because this might be something else to consider, his thing is about promoting those folks who are doing murals in mm. Baltimore. Wow. Yeah, so all the taggers included. Cool. I just think that's just a cool <laughs> way to go about doing this. Why in the world are we, you know, arresting people for doing stuff like this when we're actually beautifying a city? I, that's just, that's Mark's point of view right there. So, uh, <laughs> Mark's opinion. And, yeah, Mark's opinion. All police officers watching this at this moment understand that's just my opinion. Uh, I think that some of those things are really cool. And what Redeemer has done uh, to promote the arts in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. I mean, everything from that to Heron High School to the new high school to Porching. I sure, mean, you know, yeah. you all do it. I'll do everything now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What is it that uh, most enlivens you when you think about the church community in a community? What is the thing that you first think of? Responsibility of the church or just doing good? What are some of the things that come to mind? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first thing I think about when the church community in a community is what does it mean to be? And so I think that has inward and outward facing implications. So 
one of the things I love a lot about Redeemer is their emphasis on community within the church. So building building relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ, investing in them, letting them know you and being known by them. And then I think porching is a really great small example of how do we turn that outward? How do we get to know our neighbors and welcome them into um, this community? And I think hospitality can be one of the best witnesses for the gospel probably that there is. Um, so just letting people do life with you and see what mm. see what that looks like. One of the things that you mentioned hospitality. Yes, absolutely. One of the things that strikes me is really sad. When we look at passages like Titus 1 or 1 Timothy 3, we actually, in 1 Timothy 3, it gives 15 characteristics of an elder, for instance. One of them that hardly ever gets mentioned is hospitality. Yeah. I mean, think about the importance of that, right. but it's hard, it's hardly ever mentioned. Yeah. So thank you for mentioning it. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah, there you go. You're welcome, Titus. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that... Uh, one of the things that strikes me about our conversation about the church community is to tell you about my family in Defiance, Ohio. So uh, our kids, my my daughter uh, married a church planner, and they are planning church, have been for uh, going six years now in Defiance, Ohio. They have four children. And one of the things that they do really well and one of the things they really want to focus on is hospitality. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Like I have been this right. whole time. And I'm going to ask you if you were going to kind of set up some kind of thoughtful process of hospitality, if you're going to set up a plan or a program or just off the cuff or whatever it might be, what do you think about doing hospitality in the city? Well, this is not my idea, but it's something that I know happens, um, which I think is great. But one of my coworkers in her neighborhood does a thing called the Supper Club. So it's every Sunday night, and they take each neighbor takes turns hosting dinner at their house. So they have to prepare food for probably a lot of people, um, but then that rotates, and it's just their neighborhood. And so that's a really special way to get to know get to know your neighbors, share a meal together, and you only have to cook. Like you know, if you have twelve neighbors, that's only once a year. So, well, once a whatever the math is, a few yeah. months, <laughs> but only have to be major. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Those kinds of ideas, I think, are ones that uh, we don't really spend much time talking about, much less doing. And so when we have a show like this and we can say, hey, uh, this is how one way that people do hospitality, it might be very sure. important. Let's, uh, let's move into an area that may or may not feel comfortable, uh, which uh, has to do with how do we take this concept of hospitality into, wait for it now, the political realm? So when we're talking about how do we get along in a fractured culture where everybody's sure. kind of yelling at each other, what part do you think hospitality could play to perhaps recapture, or reconstitute, restore uh, the process of politics within the concept of hospitality? Yeah, that's a great question. I this might not be the answer you're looking for, but I <laughs> I don't know if if it has to look different than it does in any other sphere. So if you're not being hospitable because of a political you, um, I think as Christians, there's a recognition of that's not our first allegiance, anyways. Our first allegiance is to um, the kingdom of God, and so in that, like you love your neighbor and you, you love your brother and sister in Christ who shares a different opinion. And then you start there and you get to know them. Um, so yeah, I really, I, and I think it's asking the hard questions and, and freeing people up to give answers that are different than what you think and have them know that that doesn't change the relationship in any way. And what you say to somebody face to face is going to be very different than what somebody might say anonymously on social sure. media. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe don't say things on social yeah, media. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> Let's just say that. Do not say things on social media. Just putting that out. Uh, as this, we Facebook live. Yes, yeah, we are yeah. Facebooking live. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, this is a good thing. You know, this social media is a very good platform. Yeah. Uh, let me. Let me nuance this in a different way, since I'm picking up on all your words here. Uh, one of the words you used just a moment ago was the word sphere. 
So you must be Kyperian in your approach to culture. I'm not, I'm putting you on the spot. No, here, it's sorry. okay. I did actually look. Somebody told me that the other day, so I had to look up. Yeah. Who that was. Yeah. So I, think that, I think that's true. It is. Yeah. yeah. Spear sovereignty yeah. actually is what it's called. And Abraham Kuyper, who was president of the Netherlands for some time in the late 19th century, uh, came up with a concept that we all live in spheres. So there's the sphere of education, politics. You right. could add, add any number of things to this. Whatever your sphere is, and it could be the neighborhood you live in, it could be your home, it could be the people you live with, whatever. Uh, all of those things are your spheres, and you then bear responsibility within that sphere to do good. Absolutely. So the hospitality thing just seems to be a natural outgrowth yeah. of doing good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So this idea of sphere sovereignty and how you're practicing this and how you get along with people that might not agree with you, to actually invite them to your home, to have... A drink with them. Well, maybe not because you're not 21. Coffee. Yet. Coffee. Yeah. Yeah. coffee for her. Uh, so, you know, those kinds of things where we actually sit and have conversations with people. This obviously takes place in the university campus. Right. So, uh, can you tell us in an incident, a story, uh, maybe something that stands out in your memory about a conversation that you've had in the past with somebody maybe with whom you disagree or maybe some of you agree with? But the conversation took on a different tone. It's the how and when question mm -hmm. again. Took on a different tone because you were sitting like we're sitting right here, face to face, talking with somebody else, and how you communicate that. So, a story, an incident, a specific endeavor, maybe a class that stands out in your mind. Uh, tell us something about your engagement and how you interacted with somebody in communication in ways that was positive and good. Sure. I have several that come to mind. I think I had a lot of conversations in college. I was a religious studies major minor at IUPUI. So there were a lot of challenging conversations that came from that. And so I had one class in particular where there was a lot of group discussion. And I just found myself wanting to kind of challenge the premises of people's arguments a little bit because I think it's really hard even for myself to when I make an argument to think about, like, wow, is that even well supported? Do I even know what I'm talking about? Usually <laughs> not. Um, it's just what I believe. Um, and so trying to get people to take a, even a step back. And when that happens face to face, I, that's usually received really well. And I was really impressed with how open people who probably appear hostile online were to talking about um, just what's motivating them, why they have this desire for. Yeah. Or peace or whatever they're looking for um, and how we, I could point them in that conversation to Christ. I have had tremendous um, intersections with students at IUPUI. Just had great conversations with them, believers and unbelievers both. And then I work with these fantastic faculty members. I just love them all. Uh, we don't always line up in terms of our belief system, certainly. And we have long discussions about some of those issues that we face. Uh, but when we are face to face with each other, and I think when, at least in my experience with them, it's always been very generous, even when we're writing something to each other online or something. Right. Um, the wonder of that, though, is that you form this relationship with somebody first. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely. Huge. Yeah. So let me come back to something that you mentioned. You approached, or I think you used the word attacked, but you. Uh, I hope I did. <laughs> <laughs> you, you challenged premise of conflict. So two of the uh, words that I emphasize to people in this regard have to do with assumptions and authority. When you think about your university years, and maybe even anticipating more of this mm -hmm. to come, how much of what people deal with or what should they deal with as it relates to assumptions? Uh, give us an idea of why that's so important, where people begin in their presuppositions sure. or beginning their thought processes. Absolutely. In my experience, and even just knowing myself, I I think that everybody ha is coming from a place of assumptions, even if it's not some they recognize. So even patterns of thought that have been in place since the Enlightenment or even before the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. Enlightenment shaping how people um, think and what they consider to be the most real thing and the most true thing 
those are all at play. I think those are really valuable to understand, but not to put all the weight on what mm-hmm. those assumptions are. And then I think the best thing you can do is ask questions and, and try to sense out like where where are they coming from? What's their what is their background of thought and, and belief? And even if you don't ever say, This is what I've determined your assumptions to be, um, <laughs> just knowing that yourself and that can help you have more gracious and critical conversations. It's really great uh, to hear those kinds of comments. Uh, one of the things that is true for us in academia, for those of us concerned with academics, either going through school or teaching school, have a lot to do with research. Um, there's an article I want to get to you that um, deals with the issue of research and the very interesting way that this was uh, written. I think it was either in the New York Times or the Atlantic. I'll get this to you. But one of the things that was said was that uh, people are having a hard time replicating studies uh, because they're finding out that the studies originally were so poorly designed. Sure. And the second thing that I noticed in this article and a word that still stands out in my thinking is the, the individual writing the article said that scientists futz, F-U-T-Z, futz with the conclusions to make them sound maybe like the questions they originally asked or if it went in a different direction, they're trying to reorganize things so that they sound good. Right. Uh, did you ever find that to be true in anything that you saw in research and philanthropy? Yeah, I actually found that to be true in a lot of how I wanted to write my papers. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people come, especially in philanthropy, maybe especially in undergrad when you're still learning what good research looks like, is you have you have your belief and your, your opinion, which forms your thesis, and then you want to write your paper based off of this thesis, and none of the evidence is supporting your thesis, so... You know, you do the thing or you take the quote from here, the quote from there. And then I think in my own life, at a certain point, I had to come to the fact that my my thesis, you know, might have been wrong. So I had to change. Um, but I, I do think that's very true. I, I always joke, I'm terrible with directions. Um, I've always been terrible with knowing what's north, east, south, and west. And I always joke that wherever I'm going, it's north. So I'm going facing north right now, but if I were to walk this way down the hallway, that would also be north. In my head. <laughs> and I think that is kind of how a lot of people approach their their research studies as well. Whatever I believe and feel, that's north. And I think the really valuable thing we have as Christians and in the university setting and the work setting is like we have a, a north already picked out for us. Mm-hmm. We know we know what is true, and that is can center you and then affect how you how you live. That is a fantastic metaphor. And if there's a clip that you want to pull out of this whole podcast, that would be the one right there. Not the one about me getting nauseous. No, not, not about that. nauseousness. No, not about that. Uh, let me just end our program here today, uh, not only by thanking you, but give us about a 30-second clip about why it's so important to have established principles of life already in place as a 20-year-old. Why is that so important? Do I have those? Are they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you do. You do. I'm Trust establishing me. them. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's important because even as a, one of the things I get most excited about is telling my peers and my friends that it's okay to have real beliefs at 20 and it is okay to have real things you're doing and to be stepping into, into the real world and engaging with real people. And to do that well, I think you have to have principles and recognizing that you, you do have principles. You might not know what they are, but they're there. And making sure that those are what you want to build your life and your hope on. And just thinking, I mean, these are big questions and and they're important to think about because they do kind of shape the trajectory of your life here. And there's your true north. <laughs> yeah, there, well, if they're in Christ. There's your yes, true north. <laughs> there it is. There it is. You've been listening to Warp and Woof Radio, Radio TV at the Pool Group site. We come to you every Wednesday from 11 to 1150. Next week, I'm going to have the pleasure of uh, having one of the folks uh, joining us uh, next week. Ashley will be joining us. Does some great work. She's got a really great history to tell us about. But this week, we're really grateful for Elizabeth Williams dropping by, grateful for the words that she had to, sh- to share with us. 
not only about all of the wonderful and good things that she's doing in and around the community in Indianapolis, but also from a very decidedly Christian point of view. We're looking forward to next week. Thankful for this week. Thanks for joining us again. Warp and Wolf Radio. We'll see you next week.